Welcome to Electric Liberty Land here on the Lions of Liberty podcast, your weekly shot of culture, comedy, and liberty with your host, Brian McWilliams. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Electric Liberty Land here on the Lions of Liberty podcast. Do I sound more like a radio DJ today? It's probably because my voice is a little uh, little scratchy here. Not scratchy, per se. It's a little bit uh, worn out from uh, a weekend in Vegas. Just got back from a bachelor party with a, uh, some friends, and I'm a little worn out. Which is also why I'm doing the show solo today. I'm gonna, I know it makes no sense to do a show solo when you're tired, but my uh, my original guest had to cancel on me. Fortunately, he had to be out of town, and instead of booking somebody else on short notice, I said, "You know what? Uh, let's just fly solo through this one. A little bit of rambling. Never hurt anybody. Rambling man, you know, gambling man, just like Vegas." If you guys are wondering, you say, "Brian, hey, did you convert any disbelievers?" to the cause of liberty while you're in Vegas? Well, the answer to that's no. <laughs> it's, it, takes, it takes a little longer. Although alcohol is a good way to convince people uh, to the benefits of liberty. You get their ear long enough, you can talk some sense into these people. But I will tell you a quick aside about when I was in Vegas. Uh, so the one time I did get to talk about libertarian values was that a bunch of these guys, they were in from Maryland. You can't have a sports book in Maryland because you can't have a sports book almost anywhere except Vegas. And I think maybe one other uh, one other state allows it. It might be Delaware. And the reason for that is ridiculous. It all comes from this big, this big background wherein, you know, they were trying to combat point shaving and they were trying to combat uh, crime and the mafia's involvement in sports gambling and betting. So. Because of that, that's why we don't have sports books anywhere except Vegas. And you know why it's in Vegas? Because of crony capitalism, of course. It's all cronyist policy. There's somebody on the inside that made sure that Vegas got godfathered in. They were able to keep the sports books. So I was able to uh, convey that little information upon them and just tell them how ridiculous it was that government regulations were stopping people from spending their own hard-earned money that they should be able to do whatever they wanted to with. Now, I did not get too much into the other stuff that um, Nevada offers, although Vegas does, in such as legalized prostitution with these gentlemen. I don't want to put any ideas into people's heads, you know, because, hey, depending on what time you're walking around the casino and how much money you're down, maybe a little uh, dozy-eyed dough <laughs> might look pretty good to drown your sorrows in. So I don't need to get anybody's marriage ruined. But uh, that just brings up another thing, though, that, you know, you look at, at Nevada and you look at how it's licensed. Prostitution is legal in certain specialized brothels at different uh, different parts of the county or different counties throughout Nevada. But it brings up the broader question of just like Vegas as a whole, where Vegas has sports booked, the rest of the country doesn't. Why the hell does only part of Nevada have it? And why only in these special licensed brothels? Why can't people just post on Craigslist? Why can't people go to backpages.com or whatever? Whatever's not shut down anymore because the government keeps shutting all these places down. Why can't they go on there? If you want to sell your body, you should be able to. If you want to engage in a voluntary transaction with somebody else, with a sex worker, you should be able to do that. She controls her body. You control your body. It's both voluntary interaction. What's the problem? Who's it hurting? Nobody. On that same note, you should be able to do anything with your body. If you want to sell your body parts off willy-nilly, go for it. If you want to make a contract with another human being where it says, this man has my permission to kill me and eat my body, he should be able to do it. Now, that sounds crazy, like crazy rambling and ranting, but in Germany, people had that exact arrangement, and a guy went to jail for it. <laughs> but, I mean, if that's a contract you're making, that's a contract between you and another person. That's a private contract. The government should have no, no authority in that circumstance, to press charges for murder. If it's a pre-agreed on, he's going to eat this body, go for it. Maybe my family needs the money. Government, who, I mean, who's to say? And on that note, I'm sure you're itching to know where you can find the show notes for this episode, which is, of course, episode number eight of Electric Liberty Land, which means you could go to lionsofliberty.com forward slash ELL8. To find this, you can find all of the archives for Electric Liberty Land at lionsofliberty.com forward slash ELL. And also, guys, make sure you check out the other podcasts, Mark Clear on Mondays with in-depth look at uh, different personalities in the libertarian movement. 
John Odermatt on Fridays, Felony Friday. Uh, that looks at felonies on Friday and the criminal justice system. And also, guys, check us out on the different platforms we have. Twitter, for example, at Lions of Liberty. Come join the Facebook forum. Make sure you have a picture. <laughs> Otherwise, we're not going to let you in. Also, I uh, usually say nobody with a picture that's a tiger as an avatar gets in. But I think, I'm not sure if somebody's just trolling me now and changed their picture after we let them in. But there's a guy I was interacting with on Facebook just today about Milo uh, Yiannopoulos, uh, who I will talk to, or I talked about, excuse me, at length towards the end of the show. Uh, but I was having a nice conversation back and forth with him. So I don't know. Maybe I got to change my tiger avatar face policy. He, uh, he seemed like he was engaged, not just a troll or a uh, Nigerian rapper. So that's good. Uh, also, guys, there's different ways you can support the show now. So please do that. We now have T-shirts. Those are awesome. Lionsofliberty.store. And I'm going to tell you who made those T-shirts a little later in the show, too. And then also... Check us out. We have a new way to support the podcast because it's the only way we're going to grow is with support from listeners like you. We're like PBS, except that I would never be allowed on PBS. So go to lionsofliberty.com forward slash support. You can sign up to support us through Podbean. And uh, there's different benefits there, different tiers that, you know, you get a T-shirt and you get a koozie and you get a koozie and a T-shirt and you get to ask questions. I might do a Reddit AMA because everybody wants to know what kind of, of cereal I eat. It's Captain Crunch, peanut butter crunch. Delicious. Anyway, so that's that. Now let's move on to some of the actual content in the show. What do you say? I'm sure you said yes. In your car alone, like a loser. All right. So first thing I want to talk about, guys, there is a women's march. Well, there was a women's march, right? That took place. I talked about it a little bit on the show because it confused me in that I couldn't figure out what the actual point of the march was. It's even to have 15 different targets. Okay, we're marching uh, just in general for women's rights. Okay, now we're marching for the rights for women to have abortions, uh, which, by the way, is, you know, there's women's right to not have an abortion, too. So I don't know. They, they wouldn't allow the people that wanted to go against abortions. Um, they were marching for Muslim rights and immigrant rights. And Madonna spoke for some odd reason and threatened to blow up the White House. It was all a crazy mishmash. But you know what? They got a hell of a lot of people to turn out. That's great. Uh, the One of the founders of the march spoke, even though she's a huge fan of Sharia law, which you'd think people would probably not be too much for if they knew that, considering how much they uh, they squash the rights of women, especially you know, Saudi Arabia and anywhere, well, anywhere with Sharia law is pretty awful. So anyway, those people now are going to have a day without women's strike. That's going to take place on March 8th. You might ask yourself, did we just have a march for a day without somebody? Well, yes, we just had a day without immigrants. And, you know, as I posted on Twitter about this, and if you want to, feel free to follow me on Twitter. It's just at Brian McWilliams. Must have gotten in early enough to get that uh, that handle. Very important name. So I tweeted this on Twitter, though. I, you know, I, I don't know if this day without immigrants is going to go over so well, mainly because unlike you social justice warriors, you elite people who can take off days at a time or, you know, just take off classes or do whatever the hell you're going to do. They actually have to go to work. So I'm sure the nation's workers said, well, I, I kind of want to feed my family. And it's not worth it to me to risk my job to take this day off just to make a statement, which, again, I mean... I, I guess people kind of kind of appreciate it. And, and look, God forbid, I'm not saying you shouldn't protest. You should. And I am also a huge advocate of hurting the business. If you want to make a statement against a business or a business practice, then you hurt the business. But this is a political statement. And a lot of the businesses that people actually took a day off from going to work, a lot of these immigrants, they got fired. And people are saying, oh, how dare you, you can't fire him. But a lot of these people, and number one, they didn't show up and they didn't say they weren't coming intentionally, mind you, to make the impact felt. So if you're a business owner, say, look, I gave you a job. And especially if you were an illegal immigrant, I gave you a job at the risk of my business. Because if somebody comes and cracks down to me, I'm now risking my business to give you employment when you might not even have legal, uh, legal status in this country. You might not have a real social security card. I'm taking a risk. And now you just screwed me by not showing up to work. So a lot of them got fired. Now, the day without women's strike, 
I'm sure nobody will get fired because that would be a whole big firestorm. And I'm sure a lot of these women are doing jobs that are not simply easy to replace, like a lot of, you'd say, lower and immigrant jobs would be. So on March 8th, here's what I'm saying we should do, guys. It's a day without women. I'm saying here on Electric Liberty Land, and I apologize to all the women out there, but you're free to come on in and join in the fun. I'm saying that March 8th is a bring your stripper to work day. Now, granted, some of those strippers might take off the day because it's a day without women. (laughs) I know that. But I'm hoping there's a lucky few that we can ply with money to come on in and we'll have a nice day of drinking and strippers at the workplace. It'll be wonderful. The women will be home. We'll go out and get some hot wings. It's going to be fantastic, guys. So uh, I'll be putting around a petition uh, anytime now. And just voice your support. Go ahead and tweet it at me. We'll get that day with, uh, we'll call it a day with hookers. No, oh, I mean a day with strippers. Shh. Don't want to say that too loud outside of Nevada. Okay, next topic. Real briefly, I want to talk about Michael Flynn getting canned as national security advisor to Donald Trump. Uh, I don't want to go too much here. Just being said, I, I, you know, Enough people have talked about this now that I don't want to harp on it. I do want to talk about the new appointment of H.R. McMaster. So, you know, leading up to this, the scariest thing about Flynn, I'm sure you know the background now, but, you know, was that he was caught speaking with Russian representatives in advance of Trump coming into office. Now, granted, the scariest thing about that is that he was being monitored by the CIA when he was a private citizen. Remember that private citizen. So the CIA or the NSA is monitoring his communications in his private life while he's a private citizen. And then somebody within Trump administration, somebody from the deep state, let's let's be honest, leaked that information to the media to damn Flynn. And, And meanwhile, the FBI did an investigation into the actual conversations that took place. And they said that nothing in there was was anything that really needed to be covered up. Nothing was giving away secrets. Nothing was nefarious. It was just a conversation, which, by the way, Hillary Clinton's camp also was speaking with the Russians in advance. And Flynn was talking about the sanctions in place, you know, talking about probably lowering the sanctions of what they could possibly do. Barack Obama's people also were in touch with the Russians during his campaign before he was president. So it's all just a whole load of BS, basically. Um, Flynn's a sacrificial lamb in this circumstance because people are out to get him. They're trying to undermine Trump at every turn. So now I'm not, I'm not going to say that Flynn was an amazing guy. I'm not going to say even that I think he would have done a great job as a national security advisor, but it is scary to see how people are trying to pick off each and every one of Trump's people one by one, the people in this deep state who are reaching up and just trying to undermine him at every turn. I mean, that's terrifying if you're a president. And I'm hoping that more people are going to wake up to this. You know, I think um, on part of the problem, Dave Smith was saying, and I agree with them. I've never heard so many people talking about the deep state. We're talking about it constantly now in the past few weeks in our own little Lions of Liberty internal chain, you know, with me and Howie and Mark and Rico, all of the guys that you hear on this podcast, we have an ongoing uh, a dialogue. And even we're saying that it, it's kind of crazy to think how this is all coming out and becoming, they're, they're pulling the mask off. They're opening the curtain and showing What's going on? All the machinations beneath the surface of this. And that's amazing. And I'm hoping that people are picking up on it. Now, moving on from that, um, H.R. McMaster, the new national security advisor to Trump. Who is the guy? Is he good? Is he bad? Mm, I don't think he's going to be great. I'll tell you that much. Uh, In reading a bit about him, they're, they're calling him a warrior scholar which is always interesting. So this man's a warrior scholar. The reason they call him a warrior scholar is that he had written a book, which is widely renowned, called The Dereliction of Duty. And hold on, I have to look the exact title. It's very long. Dereliction of Duty. Lyndon Johnson, Robert McNamara, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the Lies That Led to Vietnam. And it's basically a text breaking down the Vietnam War, what went wrong, how all the tactics fell apart, and also... He goes into damn Johnson and jam, damn all these these chiefs of staff because they basically took a tact wherein Lyndon Johnson uh, did more just to try to stay elected than he did to actually end the war in Vietnam or take the right tactics in the war in Vietnam. 
So I've not read the book. This is just what I have read in little snippets, but it sounds fairly interesting. And from the outside, you say, okay, so this is a guy who's not afraid to criticize the system, and he's not a guy that's going to rush into wars. Knowing that he wrote this whole text on Vietnam, which is the war of war, well, was the war of wars, uh, as a lesson on what not to do, of course, before we began this, this endless war on terror, but you would think saying, okay, so now he's going to have a good perspective on it. But then I read the comments from one Mr. or one Senator, John McCain. And John McCain thinks that McMaster is just going to be the bee's knees. And that, frankly, terrifies the living hell out of me. John McCain said, I give President Trump great credit for this decision, as well as his national security cabinet choices. I had the honor of knowing McMaster for many years, and he is a man of genuine intellect, character, and ability. He knows how to succeed. He could not imagine a better, more capable national security team than the one we have right now. Now, if you know anything about John McCain, which I'm sure people do who listen to this podcast, John McCain is a goddamn buffoon. The man is a warmonger who seems to want to go in and get boots on the ground and always take action in other nations and has no problem trying to topple dictatorships and topple other and, and, and basically destabilize regions at a whim. And he's been doing the same damn thing for the past 25 years. He takes absolutely no lessons from history. He has no change in his tactics or opinions over time, despite the fact that again and again and again, we have the same failed result. He's all for arming the insurgents here. He's all for arming Al-Qaeda there. He's all for you know giving the rebels whatever they need. And then it comes to bite him in the ass and he doesn't change his mind at all. That is what an idiot does. And John McCain is an idiot. So John McCain giving a ringing endorsement of H.R. McMaster to me is a little bit terrifying. That being said, you know, the guy also has written a lot of counterinsurgency books on the war in Iraq. So who knows? Maybe having been there, he'll have a little bit better angle on it. But uh, the number of war hawks and neocons on the Hill that are excited about this appointment makes me think that this is one that we're really going to not enjoy uh, as libertarians, that it's not going to help us in in trying to push forward a peaceful vision as far as the way we interact in the Middle East. It's not going to help Donald Trump take a step back and stick to his policy of not forcing regime change in the Middle East. So one to be worried about, kids. I <laughs> know uh, it's not going to help you sleep at night. So let's just roll this into the next topic real quick, because actually John McCain is going to serve as a perfect douche bridge um, in these two topics. So I want to talk a little about Randy Pants. Now, Rand Paul took a little time out of his day to take a jab at McCain, and I love every minute of it. Here's what Rand said. Everything he said that he, being John McCain, says about the president is colored by his own personal dispute he's got running with President Trump, and it should be taken with a grain of salt because John McCain's the guy who's advocated for war everywhere, Paul said on ABC's This Week. He would bankrupt the nation. We're very lucky John McCain's not in charge because I think we'd be in perpetual war. So, you know, just real quick, we got to give that applause. Yes, Apollos. Good job, Randy Pants, calling out McCain. So again, you can see why I'm so terrified of McCain like H.R. McMaster, um, who I'm guessing got his name from H.R. Lovecraft in some way, shape, or form, right? H.R., H.R. How many H.R.s are there? So be afraid. Again, be very afraid. But good job, Rand. All right, let's go to something Rand adjacent for another quickie before I take a quick break from a word from our sponsor. Uh, Actually, I'm going to say the words from our sponsor. You guys are in for a treat. No breaks for me talking today until I get to Milo's clips later. But Rand Paul, if you'll recall, uh, good start to a song. Rand Paul, if you recall, uh, Rand Paul called on Congress to say, hey, let's put a stop to this abuse of AUMFs, which is basically authorization for use of military force uh, that came into being after September 11th and basically gave the president the authority to do these little interventions uh, worldwide to combat terrorism without having to get an actual declaration of war by Congress. At least that's my best understanding of what's of why they can do this. So Rand Paul said, Hey, enough of this crap. 
Congress is the only one who can declare wars. And what you're doing is not these the intent of what this is for. It's not a quick response to something that happens where Congress might be too slow to act to respond to a terrorist attack in this manner. Because that was the whole thing. You know, it's we get attacked. We need to respond quickly. It's not an official war in the sense that it's not us versus another nation with all this buildup, you know, like the Cold War or anything like that. It's a quick response thing. That, of course, has been abused by all of these presidents, by Bush, by Obama, and now uh, uh, presumably by Trump. I mean, Trump did already kill a girl with a strike in Yemen, an American eight-year-old girl. So Rand Paul had tried to stop it. That was when the Democrats controlled the houses and the Senate. So, of course, that went nowhere. They, you know, there was there a widespread Democratic support? Was there a realization of how Obama had overstepped the powers he was supposed to have, how he had kept us in a state of perpetual war throughout his tenure? No, of course not. No, no. Rand's bill got no support. Which is why it was so funny today when I saw this story about Barbara Lee, a representative from California in the House. She put forward her own letter to President Trump, co-signed by like 12 other Democrats and one Republican, Walter Jones of North Carolina. Good job, Walter Jones of North Carolina, who I know nothing about. But good job signing on to this letter, calling for Trump to rein in the use of AUMFs for Congress to officially declare war on ISIS and make it, which I still don't understand how you can officially declare war on ISIS. It's, I mean, it's a nice thought. Uh, It's a nice thought when Rand did it too, but you're declaring war on a people. And if you're declaring war on a people, isn't that just genocide? (laughs) If we're being perfectly honest, uh, if you're trying to wipe out just a certain number of people, uh, specific people, it's a little bit of genocide but I understand. It's, it's different. It's different. But still, when you're trying to combat somebody, you're, you can declare war on them, but you're still going to 17 different countries. You're still bombing these random locations where they're hiding out. You're still doing it domestically and abroad. So it's w- declaring war in a completely different sense than a traditional way. That being said, still would be nice to have something in there so it's not just the president kind of willy-nilly taking pot shots here and there, calling a strike here, calling a strike there with nobody to check his authority. So good job, Barbara Lee, on being uh, one of the world's biggest hypocrites. This is like catching your husband cheating and getting all upset. And then as soon as the guy leaves the house, banging somebody else, you know, it's like you have to have a set of morals that crosses the aisle or you have no morals at all. Now, let me take a quick minute to give a word from our sponsor for today's show, who actually happens to be a good friend of our podcast. And that is Mr. Dan Smots of Goulash Media. You may already be familiar with Dan's work. For example, Dan created all of our new Lions of Liberty t-shirt designs. And on top of that, he also famously created my very own Mr. Johnson's Liberty Hood graphic. If you remember Bill Weld holding up little Gary Johnson as a puppet in the land of make-believe, that was the work of Dan Smots and Goulash Media. But Dan also does an entire range of creative services. From graphic design to videography to wedding videos and wedding photography audio editing and production, Dan can do it all. Now, Dan's based out of the Quad Cities in Illinois, but he's happy to travel, and I highly recommend that you hire him for anything you might need. With over 10 years of professional experience, he's not going to let you down, and you'll also be hiring a friend in Liberty. Dan has been a longtime supporter of our podcast. In fact, he credits Lions of Liberty for being one of the reasons that he's really been brought into the Liberty movement. So please, check him out at goulashmedia.net. That's goulash like the food, G-O-U-L-A-S-H, media.net, or you can also visit him at goulashfilms.com. I'm a gay man and a child abuse victim. Between the ages of 13 and 16, two men touched me in ways they should not have. One of those men was a priest. My relationship with my abusers is complicated by the fact that at the time, I didn't perceive what was happening as abusive. But I can look back now and see that it was. I still don't view myself as a victim, but clearly I am one. Welcome 
to the wizarding world of Donald Trump than Milo Yiannopoulos. Yes, Harry. There be wizards here. <laughs> now, why am I playing Harry Potter music after that uh, break, you might ask yourselves? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because if you've been following along with Donald Trump and everything we've been saying about Donald Trump, you know that we consider him a wizard of the highest powers. And this comes from a Scott Adams blog, the guy who created Dilbert, where he lays out what a wizard is. And basically, a wizard is somebody that can manipulate people's minds through the use of words, that can take negative situations and turn them to his advantage easily. And if you caught Milo's press conference today, and the masterful way in which he has turned all of the negativity that came about from this podcast he recorded over a year ago, wherein he was accused of condoning pedophilia, you will not doubt that Milo is the Harry Potter to Trump's Dumbledore. And that maybe Breitbart.com is the Hogwarts. Now, a little bit of history. So Milo was on a podcast called the Drunken Peasants Podcast. And he was on there and he, you know, he talks in a very glib way, very sarcastic, very off the cuff. And he always has and always will. Now, what he said in this podcast is this. In the homosexual world, particularly some of those relationships between younger boys and older men, the sort of coming of age relationship, those relationships in which those older men help those young boys discover who they are and give them security and safety and provide with them, provide them with love and a reliable sort of rock where they can't speak to their parents. Now, that's one quote. He also went on to talk about, you know, a 13-year-old, but he was talking about himself and his own experience when he said 13. But everybody latched on to this comment about young men and older men, or younger boys and older men. Now, let me just lay this out. If you're not familiar with gay culture, if you're not familiar with the way the way it, it works sometimes in uh, homosexual relationships, Let me lay it out for you, because I have a lot of gay relatives. I have a lot of gay friends. I've seen this often. It is absolutely not unusual for a younger boy, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 through 25 to 28, whatever, to be with a much older man. And by much older, I mean 10, 15, 20 years. And Milo says it just right there. A lot of the time, these kids can't talk to their peers because maybe they're not out of the closet fully, or maybe they are, but they can't talk to their parents or as with happens a lot of the time with LGBTQ, they may have been actually kicked out of their house. So they may be staying with an older man. That older man might be providing a lot of support for them. Now, that doesn't always mean that they're in a sexual relationship. Sometimes they're just friends. But even if they are in a sexual relationship, this is between two people. They're, they're providing a lot of care, providing a lot of uh, a lot of support, and it's nothing nefarious. It's not like you know these kids are being molested or taken advantage of. They're consulting adults. So when you hear this, you know these people saying, "Oh, he's advocating for older men to be with these little kids." That's not what he's talking about at all. And this interview was taken out of context. It was blown up by a conservative media outlet called Reagan's Battalion, and you should take it with a grain of salt. It's just silly. It's ridiculous and it's insulting, to be honest. And the fact that the left and right wing media jumped on it and disseminated it so quickly and condemned him so quickly shows you where their priorities are. When MSNBC is jumping on a, uh, you know, a gay conservative for talking about what is, frankly, no closed secret within the gay community uh, that people older and younger often will date, then you know that this is just a witch hunt. And Milo says as much. Now, my background is in public relations, so I want to examine this from a PR standpoint because it is sheer wizardry when you look at it, and it was brilliantly handled by him and his team. So let's look at what happened and and the way this all rolled out. So the news breaks, right? The next day, Simon & Schuster, the publisher of his book, drops him, drops his book, which is one of the dumbest things I've ever seen a publisher do or a company do for that matter. Why? Because they already took the risk when they signed him in the first place. They stood by him through all these violent protests. So look, guys, why don't you wait another day and see how this thing's going to play out? Because if he happens to turn it around or he can defend himself, they dropped his book deal before he even defended himself. Idiots. So they, so anyway, so 
he he loses his book deal, right? And the de- next day, he goes on, has a press conference, takes the stage. And what does he say? First thing, he comes out and says that he was abused, that he was a victim of abuse, and one of them was a priest. So right away, he's setting himself as a victim and somebody that is human. Because my Lawson comes across as this really hyper-aggressive guy that doesn't give a damn about anything, doesn't care. Now he's a human. Now he's relatable. Because he has been molested in the past. But however, not by an older gay man that he was in a relationship with. And he goes on to explain those comments. So he comes out strong with the humanizing angle. And then the next thing he says is that he's got a ton of people lined up for his book. Well, no shock there. It was number one on Amazon. Of course, they're going to be lining up. And now he's going to have much better deals coming his way. Tons more money up front. Tons more money on the back end. Brilliant. Now, what's the next thing that Milo faces that might be an obstacle to him? Well, Steve Bannon is gone from Breitbart.com. So all that's left is a husk of a media reporting entity that still has a following, yes, and is the reason Milo has blown up, arguably. But it's also associated with the alt-right. It's also associated with a lot of negativity, a lot of sexism, a lot of anti-Semitism, a lot of racism. So, what does Milo do? He gives all the credit in the world to Breitbart, says how they've supported him, even though they, over the last couple of days, they've kind of pulled back from him, but says how they've supported him through everything, says that he always will consider them friends and he treats friends right. And by doing so, he has to step down and resign from Breitbart because he doesn't want to have any more negativity pile on his friends and his company. Now, that is genius. That is witchcraft. Because you see, he's now separating himself He's separating himself from an entity that has nothing but negative associations for him. He's already gotten his audience from that website. And now he's cut out one more thing that the media, that his detractors, that the left wing can attack him on. Because he's no longer an editor at Breitbart. He's no longer working for this quote unquote alt-right media outlet. Genius. What's the next thing he says? Let's be clear about what's happening here. This is a cynical media witch hunt from people who do not care about children. They care about destroying me and my career, and by extension, my allies. They know that although I made some outrageous statements, I've never actually done anything wrong. They held this story back. They held the footage back. Footage has been out there in the wild for over a year because they don't care about victims. They don't care about children. They only care about bringing me down. They will fail. I will, in the next couple of weeks, be announcing a new independently funded media venture of my own and a live tour in the coming weeks and new campus tour dates. Ba-boom! You see that? He not only accurately slams the media for targeting him in this witch hunt, for for holding this video back and trying to use it at, at a certain time to take him out, but also on their hypocrisy. They, they don't care. The media, if you look at the reporting the media did about the church scandal, much of that was handled with kid gloves. And much of it continues to go misreported and underreported. The reassignment of priests goes underreported or not reported at all. And for Milo to call him out here is great. But not only that, what else does he say? That the pivot is complete from Breitbart. So now he's distanced himself from Breitbart completely. And he's now turned and ta-da, I now have my new media portal. So all the people that are going to miss his rating, his following from Breitbart, he's telling them, look, I've got a place for you to go. And even better for Milo, this new media platform, whatever it's going to be, TBD Milo Town, that is now going to be someplace that he can control all the content. He can brand all of it and he can use it to cross promote every single thing he's doing. So that means his speaking tours, his books, book tours, his performances, and any online content he might have. Whether that be audio, whether that be video, I don't know what he's planning, but all that stuff. And best of all, guess who has all the revenues from this new media platform? He doesn't have to split with Breitbart. He's not on a salary anymore. He's creating it and he's getting all the revenue. 
all funneled to him. Milo. Wizardry! So I'm telling you, this is all brilliant. Now, guys, I'm not saying this all just to, to come out here because I don't think Milo is any beacon of liberty, by the way. Um, I just want to point out, this is a brilliant move. And this is a man who has been attacked from all sides. So look, take a lesson to it. If you're working and you're a personality, this is how you want to handle things. I mean, if you're faced with opposition like this, you can't do it any better. Now, I was asked in the forum when we were discussing this whole situation with Milo, do I think that he's going to bring in people for the movement, for the liberty movement? I, you know, I don't know. Probably not, if we're being honest. But there is a chance there. Because once these people have been woken up to the fact that the media will go out of its way to crush you if, you, if they don't, don't like what you're saying, that can wake a lot of people up. And all you need is a crack in the armor to wedge your way in there just to start a conversation. That's what people don't realize. If you can simply start a conversation with somebody, then you have a chance to open their mind up to the ideas of liberty. We all had to start somewhere. I mean, there was none of us who was, even though we're all born with natural rights, none of us were born with the natural concept of liberty. I mean, maybe John McAfee was. He was pretty good off the cuff. But the rest of us, we had to learn from somewhere. And then you go deeper and you go deeper and you get into to Mises and you get into Rothbard and you get into the Lions of Liberty as, as clearly the pinnacle. But when you see Milo out there laying down the truth, exposing the face of the media for what it is, that's a good thing. Whether or not you like him or don't, some of what he stands for, well, I guess actually really to me, all of what he stands for should be applauded. Even if we don't agree with what he's saying, even if we don't particularly like a lot of the alt-right, I know I don't like a lot of the alt-right uh, rhetoric coming out of it, although I'm very much anti-PC, but what Milo is and what he stands for has to be supported. Freedom of speech has to be supported. Fighting back against leftists and liberal media who will attack and tear down anything that they don't agree with and try to destroy the person rather than combat the idea or debate it like that coward uh, Jeremy Shahill, I believe it is, from The Intercept that backed out of debating uh, Milo on Bill Maher because there was, quote unquote, no point in debating him. Exposing cowards like that and defeating them is important. And it's like the old, you know, the classic liberal thing. You know, I may not agree with what you're saying, but I'll fight to the death to defend it. You know, that, that clearly has been abandoned by liberals, but we still have to adopt that. That is liberty and we need to defend it, guys. So that's all I'm saying when it comes to Milo. So pardon me for my little PR rant there, my, my, uh, world, my wizarding world of Donald Trump, but I need to get that out there because I think it's important. And the last thing of this Milo story to talk about, to bring this all around to libertarianism a little bit more before my voice gives out, and I apologize, this is going to be a little bit shorter of a show. Um, I will make it up to you either with some sort of uh, goofy little bonus episode or uh, an extra long show next time. But Milo also was disinvited from CPAC. Now, CPAC, hey, they had, they had Ron Paul speak there. That was great. Rand Paul. That was great. Ron Paul, I, I believe, won the straw poll at CPAC, as did Rand Paul. So that's all great and good. But they were supposed to have Milo speak. Eh, whatever. That is up until this whole pedophile thing came out. And they dropped him like a bad habit. Now, is that surprising considering they're the conservative political action committee? <laughs> Probably not. Uh, or I'm sorry, the conservative political action conference? Probably not. Uh, the the key word of conservative there probably makes you think, you know what, they're probably not going to let this whole uh, pedophilia condoning accusation fly. So they, they dropped him pretty quickly. But what really got under my skin isn't that they dropped him. It's that Matt Schlapp, the guy who heads up uh, the American Conservative Union, which runs the, the CPAC, he went out of his way to try to uh, label Milo Yiannopoulos. Now that now that he, he they've been dumped him from the from the speaking gig, now that he's been as far when this guy knew he was still being associated with condoning pedophilia, that was the perfect time for him to call Milo a libertarian. 
Yes. Because being a libertarian is the worst thing that this son of a bitch can think of. Here's the exact quote. This is from Morning Joe. I'll just read it off to you. He doesn't call himself a conservative. He calls himself more of a libertarian. Some libertarians would deny that he is a libertarian. (laughs) Yeah, you think? I don't think anybody considers Milo a libertarian. No, nobody, right? Especially considering, like, Reason's got an article about this, about with Milo's own comments about libertarians, and he doesn't mince words. He doesn't really uh, have kind words to say about libertarians, even though Milo at times has himself said the words libertarian and liberty and yada yada. He's refers to him, but it just cracks me up. This guy, he's like, oh man, I, you know, I don't want to look like a, like I'm just throwing Milo out because he's a gay guy now. I, what can I, what can I say to really uh, throw him under the bus? I know he's a libertarian. Reminds me of an old Futurama episode where Fry is telling a horror story to the other, you know, crew members, and he's like, and then a zombie mutant libertarian jumped out of the bushes, with a hook on his hand, and it goes to show you what they're terrified of. There you go. There's a little insight into the brains of CPAC. That's what conservatives fear more. More than allegedly pedophilic uh, gay gay, uh, public speakers, they fear libertarians and liberty more. Why? Because we are a bigger threat to what they actually stand for. Because real liberty is the biggest threat to neocons and war hawks and the traditional conservatives that have been leading this country for the past 40 years. So guys, take that as a point of pride. We are the true resistance. We are the force of change that's out there. And with that in mind, please share our podcasts. Please tell your friends Maybe not about this specific podcast today, my horse uh, falling apart at the end podcast. But do please tell your friends about Lions of Liberty. Uh, Share the ideas of liberty wherever you may go. Uh, Listen to our other podcasts, Mark on Mondays, Odie on Fridays. Follow us on Twitter at Lions of Liberty. Join our Facebook forum. Buy our t-shirts created by the beautiful Dan Smots of Goulash Media. And guys, most importantly, from me here at Electric Liberty Land, always stay plugged in to Liberty.